Thank you for joining me today. I'm Madeline Blair, and this is Unlocked, a show all about opening the resilient leader in all of us. Now, have you ever heard of Pythagoras' theorem? Now, just about everyone has at some point in their education, but did you know that Pythagoras had a woman as a teacher? Today, that feels perfectly normal, yet in ancient Greece, men were the teachers. We're gonna be exploring what happens when someone pursues their passion regardless of the social system in which they live. Just think of the energy needed to do this. Today's guest will talk about women who have made significant contributions to science, yet their names are rarely known. Julia Lochran, examples of women, their challenges and how they overcame them will be our focus. Now, when we're finished our conversation, I'll again be sharing grounds for thought. So stay tuned for what is brewing. Welcome back. I'm Madeline Blair, your host of Unlocked. And I'd like to introduce you to today's most interesting guest, Julia Lochran. Julia, welcome to Unlocked. Thank you, Madeline. It's so great to be here. I just love your the premise of your show and your shows, and I've enjoyed watching them, and it's nice to be a part of it. Oh, thank you. Well, let me tell them about you. She okay. is the president of ThoughtLink, Inc., and after years of helping distributed teams improve their performance through computer games and simulations, Julia is pursuing her passions. She teaches classes at UNC Asheville College for seniors, including a program on the unknown women of science. From Themostoclea, the teacher of Pythagoras, to Rosalind Franklin, who first discovered the double helix of DNA, women have made contributions that science has often used without attribution. Join Julia and me and be inspired by the women across history who have added to our understanding of life and the universe and how they overcame the obstacles that stood in their path of passion. Inspiration will be only one benefit of joining us. All right, Julia. All right. Now, I'm really interested, first of all, in you. I mean, our topic is passion and perseverance, uh, especially when it comes to women in science, but you've actually had a career in computer science, doing something that some people would not even consider science. Tell us about your work to improve the productivity of distributed teams and how did you end up there and how did it form you what you're doing today? Yeah, isn't it funny how where where and when we end up where we are? Um, I wish there was more like I had a premonition that this is where I wanted to be, but you know <laughs> that's sometimes not what happens. And and sometime I'd like to talk to you about your role models. But um, I had three older brothers who all encouraged me to study science, and I took the very first computer programming science class my high my high school which is crazy because I'm sure now it exists, you know, and is everywhere. But um, I took it and I really enjoyed it. But really, my undergraduate degrees were in English and communication. So I became a technical writer <laughs> and I started as a technical writer and worked for a government think tank. But the think tank was building expert systems for the FBI. We were catching bad guys building rule-based expert systems. And that got me very interested in the field of computer science and expert systems and artificial intelligence. So I did go back to school to get a master's degree in artificial intelligence back in 1993. This is really pre-chat GPT. You didn't even to smell <laughs> just a little, it. just a little. <laughs> Just a little, um, but but I then started working with using computer simulations to train teams, and so that's sort of how I got my background. When I started ThoughtLink, after I got my master's degree, 
Um, I hired a lot of people that are called industrial organizational psychologists, mm -hmm. and they study teams of people at work because we wanted to understand distributed teams. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you mentioned that it it's not thought of as being scientific. It was, I mean, we gathered data and we ran experiments about how teams communicated and how they built trust. So there was a lot of science layered into this understanding of teams. Um, you know, from there I started, I noticed that the big things about successful teams is not only how they come together, but the personalities of the people on the team and are they passionate and do they love what they do and and you know do they share information so um that got me into kind of studying and helping i i did run a for a while a life coaching company for kids um and taught them these these traits and now that i'm semi-retired i just find that I, what am I, I'm also passionate about is teaching and I love uh, learning new stuff. So when I started learning about these women scientists, I was hooked and, um, <laughs> and I've been teaching that for a couple of years now and I keep adding more scientists. So now we're, we're nearing 200 scientists I cover in an eight week course. So we're going to have to pare that down for today's show. You know, I, I have to say you, you telling me that it's now up to 200 something. I used to teach an executive retreat for the Chamber of Commerce in, in uh, Cincinnati. And one of the things we did was because it was for executive women. And so we wanted them to know that there were women leaders in the world. And so we started collecting images of women leaders. And by the time we finished, the, the entire room, which was like, I don't know, 30 by 40, huge, there was a row of, of, of images around all the way around the room of Isn't that great? leaders. <laughs> I love that. Well, yeah, that's what, I mean, made me think, um, I love all of these stories have somebody who was an inspiration to these women. Yeah. And I'm sure in your life, you were probably inspired. I don't know if by women, I mean, I was definitely urged on by my brothers, but uh, my older brothers, but how about you? What, were there people that served as role models for you? Oh, most definitely. Uh, but they were all in the family. Um, my mother, my mother was a huge uh, uh, model because she ran a farm. She had a, a small business. Uh, and, and she was amazing. Yeah. And I had an aunt who also was in, you know, worked she didn't just stay home. She worked. So those were some simple models for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, there were no, I, I can't say I was inspired by Marie Curie. No, right. I, I wasn't. Right. I, uh, but I had those. Well, two. you know, and it's funny you mention her because, like, when you talk about women of science, that's the one name people that's can a, say. <laughs> that's right. So it's funny. I don't even really cover her in my unknown women of science because she's you like know. she's the poster child for known women of science. That's right. I mean, still she was amazing, and and she's the only woman to have won two Nobel prizes, wow. both in uh, physics and chemistry. Uh, so she's very inspiring. But you know, it's all the small stories that people can more relate to because I think. If you think about Marie Curie, you think I'm not going to be able to make these huge scientific discoveries, but it's just these normal everyday people who found their passion and followed it and and led to successful careers in in the science and technology yeah. fields. Well, I think we should dig into that. So okay. I know passion right. is really important. So lead lead us to at least one of those women. All right. All right. Yeah. I'm going to I'm going to kick off for uh, I was thinking, you know, really what I want to tell people is they can shoot for the stars. So I decided to start with an astronomer. And I'm going to tell you the story about Carolyn Herschel, uh, born sort of at the, the end of the 19th century. And um, she, she was amazing. She, at the age of 10, um, got typhus, which almost killed her. And because of that, she was very small. It, it affected her growth hormones or something. She was four feet, three inches tall. Wow. She was blind in one eye. Um, her mother, unlike yours, did not believe in women being educated. She thought, why, if they're going to just clean the house? 
and take care of the family. So uh, it was her father who would, when her mother was gone, would sneak her into the lessons with her older brothers. And <laughs> when her brother left Germany for England, she was sent to kind of take care of his house. And he was a musician and she was a singer. And so uh, they went to England together and her brother continued her studies in math and science mm -hmm. because her brother was fascinated with astronomy and started building telescopes. He really built the first telescope and his younger sister by his side helped him grind the lenses and build the telescopes. And she found out she was passionate about it as well. If her, if her brother was gone, she would use his telescope. Well, toward, yeah, at some point her brother discovers a new planet and that was Uranus. And it was the first planet discovered since antiquity. And King George III made her brother the chief astronomer. And he said, well, my sister works with me all the time. And King George decided to pay her. And she was, so she's the first professional paid female astronomer. Um, and again, she was always using the telescope when her brother was gone. And she found a comet and said, you know, I think there's a comet here. And there was, and she went on to discover multiple comets, multiple, multiple stars and nebulae and write a catalog of where all the stars were. And she continued this until her death at 98. In fact, after her brother died, she worked with her nephew, her brother's son, and they continued to do astronomical discoveries together until her death. And she was totally passionate about this, but she never was really recognized till 50, 100 years after her death. Mm -hmm. uh, she does have a good quote that I wanted to refer to. And one of my favorite quotes of Carolyn Herschel is, there's no royal road to science and only those who are willing to work hard and persevere can hope to achieve great things. So that's Carolyn. All right. Yeah. Pretty awesome person. Let me get us yeah. back. Let us get, yeah. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Yeah. All right. Oh, I love that story. And the fact that it was her brother and her father mm -hmm. who, who really uh, supported Harry, because you need to have a certain amount of support. You do. And it often comes from family. I mean, there's so yeah. many stories where, it, if it wasn't for a parent really pushing their mm -hmm. young daughters or their young kids in that direction, they, they, because there were no role models back then, there were no other female astronomers for her to like look at up to. That's right. Well, uh, we were talking about passion with her. Uh, I, I don't want us to move to another topic. But is there another person that you wanted to introduce around this whole concept of passion? Because I want us to talk a little bit about passion as well. Yeah, I want to talk about passion. And I've got some some examples of of, um, you know, women scientists that really were passionate um, before before we move on. I just wanted to comment that I think passion is key. Um, it turns out we're usually passionate about stuff we're good at because, <laughs> that would, you know, we tend to to motivate, or we like to do what we do well. And so when we get an opportunity to do something well, um, that's when we can really thrive. So um, I'm going to talk about women that were passionate because they found something they were very good at and they continue to do that. So, um, you know, another just comment about passion um, when people say, what is it? You know, it's what you love to do, what you could spend the rest of your life doing, like our Carolyn Herschel and never get bored. Um, and, you know, the one of the co-founders of positive psychology, uh, Mihai Chikmihaye, um, de developed the concept of flow, which is when you're in the moment, you're so self-absorbed, time goes away. And that is what you want to look for is those times that you're so passionate about something. Mm -hmm. And so with that, we'll go for my first passionate scientist. All right. Who, who really rocks, she's a geologist. So uh, <laughs> all of these women shoot shot for the stars. So this goes back to the, again, the end of, you know, the century, 1794, she was born. Uh, she lived in, in a very rural place on the coast of England. 
her father worked, I think as a farmer by day, but um, he would sell fossils and stuff on the weekend because where they lived along the coast, they could find a lot of fossils um, near their home. Well, her father died when she was just 12 years old. And in order to support the family, she kept the fossil business going. Mm -hmm. And she kept finding fossils. Her brother actually found the skull of something that looked kind of part fish, part lizard. And she ended up finding the whole skeletal remains. And because we don't have, we didn't have any animals that were part fish and part lizard, um, she proved that extinction could occur, which really rocked the church world who really believed that God wouldn't create a, an animal that he would then make extinct. So, um, so that rocked the world. There were no women geologists. There, uh, there were a lot of men geologists who would counsel with her and talk to her about her findings. And many of them would steal and publish her findings under their names. So again, a woman who did so much to contribute to the world of um, geology and not recognized, or paleontology, and not recognized until many years after her death. So um, she was um, uh, accepted into the Geological Society. Um, she was never credited for her actual discoveries till much, much later. But again, I think she was passionate. And when I think about climbing through the dirt, looking for little shards of fossils, it's not something I would find that would make me passionate about <laughs> doing that. But you know, it began with a very practical reason they had to continue to support themselves. Yes. So even though it began, or at least from our our eyes here in the 21st century, oh, this was a practical reason. And yet she found such interest that the passion was kind of built in her. Yes. Uh, yeah, wow. she was. And and tragically, I mean, she was almost killed at one time um, with a with a landslide, which actually did sadly kill her, her favorite dog. Um, but she kept, she would just persevered and also just I think she really enjoyed what she did. I mean, she loved it, yeah, yeah. Um, which was, she was passionate about it. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I have a related question to passion, a passion before we, before we move on to the next person, because every now and then I get questions from teenagers. Now you said that you did some coaching of young people, so you'll appreciate this question came from a teenager. If we don't already have a passion in our life, how can we find one? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, you need to start being more self-aware of what it is that I love to do. And, you know, teenagers I'd work with, they'd say, well, I like uh, playing computer games and I like uh, hiking with my friends or whatever it is. But it's the underlying essence of those things. Do you like to be around people or... Are you more solitary? Do you like to do a lot of reading? Do you like to? So you're looking for characteristics and traits of what it is you love to do and also what you're good at. Ask other people, what am I good at? Yeah. And if you start hearing the same answer, like, gee, I used to hear that I was good at talking with people. So, um, you know, I... I had a lot of older role models and my parents were always entertaining. So even at a young age, I would speak to older people kind of with self-confidence. And so, you know, that's why I think I love teaching so much. I love sharing. You want to find something, some way to share your special gift and, yeah. and that's your passion. But you do need to start thinking and writing stuff down and talking to others. Like, what do you think I'm good at? What am, what's my passion? Yeah. yeah. I also appreciate that it, it's not something that you know automatically. You're not born in this world knowing what your passion is. It may come out quickly. It may not. And in fact, to me, that's one of the joys of youth is that you're allowed to have some openness in your mind as to what's important to you and what's not important to you. Not only that, it can change over your life. Like I think I've had multiple passions and <laughs> And although I said your passion is something you'd want to do for the rest of your life, that that isn't always the case. Sometimes we change internally and we want to do something different. My I have three older brothers. My one brother from the age of six wanted to be a veterinarian. 
and he wanted to be an avian veterinarian and he would he trained wild crows to come to him and everything so i mean he and that's what he does now in san diego he's a avian veterinarian but um you know i always was a little jealous that he knew from his entire life what he wanted to do but that's that's so true madeline we all don't know exactly what it is that we're passionate about okay well so we, shall we shift then to persistence, yes. which I think is another huge thing about how women have made their their marks known. Sure, sure, yeah. So, um, so my example of of persistence, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about Rosalind Franklin, who she was an X-ray crystallographer, which makes means that you just take microscopic things and take. Um, take images of them. In in her case, she was taking images, this crystallographer technique of DNA. And that's the photo that basically uh, made her famous. But she could tell after she photographed this little small uh, DNA diffraction that there was something going on inside the DNA. And that something going on was the double helix. Well, you know, everyone knows of uh, Watson and, and Fricks and how they basically won the Nobel Prize for identifying the double helix. Well, they would have never discovered that without the photograph that Rosalind Franklin took, which showed the three-dimensional structure of DNA. So uh, so I think she she definitely persevered. And even after afterwards, she un unfortunately, I think she died very young of breast cancer. Um, and again, she was never recognized. I think once people argued for her, she now gets like 2% of the revenue that was generated, you know, from her finding. But um, there was even, you know, a, Watson and Crick kind of dismissed her as being flighty and not knowing anything. And, you know, she, she still persevered and did what she did because she was making a difference and, and she, she knew it. You know, when you describe how they dismissed her so often, uh, I have I have encountered that when I do my gender work, um, or did. I don't do it a great deal anymore. But when I did, it, there was a, a difference in the perception of what a person even brought to the table, uh, depending on whether they were a man or a woman. Uh, an economist, a male economist, you would be, be you, you would feature all of his papers, and the negotiations that he succeeded in. And often the female economist was referred to as somebody who's pleasant to have around. Mm. And it was just missing the fact that they were fully competent economists doing the same kind of papers, doing the same kind of negotiation. So I can see. In well, some... let me tell you, Madeline, you, you teed me up for my next scientist perfectly. Ah. And if we can go forward, I want to just talk about Yvonne Brill. Um, she was a very, she was a rocket scientist. I mean, you know, you always say, you know, she's not a rocket scientist. Well, she was a rocket scientist. She was an aerospace engineer who really invented the, and is still used today, the thruster system to keep satellites in orbit around the earth. But when she died in 2013, uh, a big obituary ran about her in the New York Times, and it started by saying, Yvonne Brill made a mean beef stroganoff. <laughs> and then and then it went on to say that she also left her career for eight years to raise the children and traveled with her husband as he moved from job to job. And then it, the, buried under the lead is this whole fact that, oh, she's a rocket scientist and made these incredible inventions that, you know, are going to be used for years and years to come because she was so incredibly smart. But let's not forget her beef stroganoff. <laughs> I, that's an amazing story. Even the New York <laughs> Times missed the mark. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. Oh, yeah, it's crazy. Well, <clears throat> I, I'm going to interrupt things and, and I'm going to add someone to this conversation. Okay, good. Uh, <clears throat> her name is Peggy Whitman. Uh, let me get her on screen. Yeah. This is Peggy Whitman. She was so, talk about persistence. She was so determined 
to become one of NASA's astronauts. After joining NASA, and she had a, it was for technical reasons, I mean, technical, in a technical arena. Uh, I, I want to say that it had something to do with organic chemistry, but that may not be true. Anyway, she's in NASA and she began to apply to become an astronaut every year for 10 years. Now, the amazing thing was that she just kept doing it. <clears throat> and when she was asked about it, she said, well, uh, I never questioned whether I would become an astronaut. The question was how. And in the end, <clears throat> she was named an astronaut. And I believe she holds the record for time in space in the space station. Yes. Uh, and she actually became the first female uh, commander of a space station. Now, why do I know all this? Because a previous guest on my show, Dr. Ruth Gotian, talking about successful people introduced Peggy Whitman to me. Now, if you're interested in this, I want you, the audience, I want you to go to my YouTube channel. It's just Madeline Blair and check out two things. The show called What Makes Success with Ruth Gotian. And for just a quick one minute clip about Peggy Whitman, check out Is Challenge Enough? It's under the Mental Espresso playlist. And if you want more of Mental Espresso, go to my website, madelineblair.com, and sign up to get your weekly copy of Mental Espresso. They are gems, anything that's less than a minute long, gems from my show, all in less than a minute. So that's, that's the end of my commercial, but I, I just had to talk about Peggy Whitman. What an extraordinary example of persistence. I love that, Madeline, and I love mental espresso. I mean, that is that is just so much fun. And I might uh, feed you with a lot of those because my course sprinkles in short YouTube videos with all of these different, very impressive women. And again, my goal is that more people will know Peggy Whitman when they hear her name or Yvonne Brill and not because of her beef stroganoff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> great. All right, let's see. Well, another quality that these women have had is high self-confidence. Why don't you talk about the importance of this? And, and do you have an example of someone with high self-confidence? Yeah, I do. So first of all, I define self-confidence as how we perceive of ourselves, how we think of ourselves. And there have been numerous studies of the benefits of having high self-confidence. People with a high self-confidence actually do more, raise themselves to higher heights. Um, they're more positive people. People with high self-confidence are, mm -hmm. are more positive. Um, they also are healthier people. Um, mm -hmm. so oh, and when I think about the greatest gift my parents gave me, I think it was a high self-confidence. They, they told me you can do whatever you want, Julia. It's, oh, they did. I was never felt like I was limited in any sense of the world. And, um, people with high self-confidence oftentimes are more, more often leaders. Mm -hmm. And it's because they exude that sort of take charge attitude. And, uh, so the one of the women I want to talk about, which I think just she's amazing when it comes to high self-confidence, comes from the medical world. And so um, I, am, I, I don't know if we were going to just breeze apart. I was going to also tell you a little bit about some inventors, which, again, in order, I just want to say, in order to have high self-confidence, um, you have to do stuff because it's innately in your disposition. And um, it wasn't until 1974, this amazes me, Madeline, that women could have their own banking accounts and credit. That's right. That is, that is right. And you I know, remember one of the that. reasons there aren't a lot of women inventors is that they would put in the invention underneath their husband's name yeah. so yeah. that they could get paid. Because yeah. if, if they submitted it, they could not actually make an income from their own invention. So that's crazy. Um, but uh, fast forwarding to, uh, I have so many examples. You know, women 
have always been somewhat involved in the medical field. In fact, you talk about the ancient Greek and Roman times. There's many examples of women who were healers or midwives or physicians of some sort. And then when, you know, medical education came into the picture, women were just completely cut out. No women could go and study medicine. Moreover, they, they never even took advantage of the knowledge that the women who did it. Yeah. Yeah, there were some women who would just study under men and do it without their credentials, um, which again took a lot of uh, chutzpah. Yeah. Um, but finally, there was the first woman, Elizabeth Browning, who actually spent time here in Asheville, North Carolina. But she was she was admitted to medical school and then had a large following of women. One of which is the woman I want to tell you about, Mary Putnam Jacoby, um, and uh, she she was really. Elizabeth Browning did not believe that women should necessarily practice as physicians, but Mary Jacoby said, no, I mean, why I want to be a physician is because I want to cure disease and I want to work with people that are sick. Um, well, at the time in the late 19th century, there were many people who questioned if women should study anything at all. And there was this guy, Edward, Dr. Clark, he claimed that when women were menstruating, um, they were lazy, unfocused. I have a, a, uh, even insane, incompetent. Um, they should refrain from doing hard work and that would include studies. So, um, he, he just made claims, false claims, by the way, with nothing to back it up. <laughs> and so Mary ran her own study, a very scientifically proven study where she tracked women and their cycles and their mental stability. And she put out a 233 page paper with documentation to say this guy's claims are untrue and so her essay called the question of rest for women during menstruation was published in 1877 and and that paper ended up winning the harvard's boystel boystel medical prize uh, because it finally kind of disproved what these lies that certain people were spreading about women and and their studies that's totally awesome. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I mean, I just think it took a lot of self-confidence. I mean, she she had somebody who was much senior to her with a lot more, you know, accolades after his name. And she said, I'm going to prove you wrong. And that's the thing. I think it takes self-confidence to stand up for ourselves. And that's what Mary Jacoby did. Fabulous. Well, I, I remember reading about her and the the... Oop the book was filled with the kinds of comments that she would receive from men or from the press and the the persistence the the, the as you say the self confidence to just keep going it was truly amazing right. uh, i when i read things like that i i wonder could i have could i have suffered all that and still uh, and still persisted uh, right. maybe i would have but you know, I don't know. <laughs> it, it does take a lot of that persistence and courage and self-confidence. And, you know, I, I just, it, it gives me more confidence and courage to think that these women way back then carved the way for us today. And that's what we got to keep pushing on. Right. Well, speaking of today, what, oh, here we go. I got to change this again. What changed in terms of opportunities for young women? We call it STEM today. Um, and what will continue to change in the coming years? This, by the way, is another question from the teens. Yeah, well, it's sort of, I mean, it reminds me of watching paint dry. If you look at how long it's taken, it's taken forever and we're still not even there. 28%, if you look at all the different fields in STEM is what women represent. And as we know, women are 50% of the population or a little higher. So we're, we're not there, um, but, it is moving forward. And I think we're slowly getting more female role models, more women teaching these subjects. Um, I just want to emphasize how young it is when, when kids get the idea of what they can and can't do. I mean, it's like before the age of seven and mm -hmm. so many kids, especially girls are convinced that they can't do math and science yeah. by their teachers, which is terrible. 
I mean, not to mention the fact that we also don't think we're artists by sixth grade, but we were all artists in kindergarten. So, I mean, it, it, it should be the teacher's job to make these people flourish in all areas. And I don't think that young girls are given even enough opportunity. I'm happy to say I have a very young niece. My oldest brother became a father for the first time at 60. Um, and he, he now has a 10 year old and she's into robotics and she's programming Legos and she's like way into science. So I love seeing that, but we need more stories like that to keep pushing, pushing this thing uphill. And so it's changing and there are, you know, now there's scholarships and there's more job openings some places, but it, we're not there yet. Don't give up. Don't stop. Don't give up. <laughs> now. I also want to go back to you. You began to mention uh, inventors. What were some things that women invented? Oh my gosh, so much! And you know, you think about they invented it because they they thought that they needed it. So one of the things that um, uh, this woman Melita Bentz invented was the coffee filter. She didn't like drinking coffee with grounds in it. And if you've heard of Melita Coffee, that's still a family owned business in Germany. Um, but she developed a whole new way to brew coffee. So I do a little toast to Melita Benz every morning when I'm having my coffee. Thanks that I'm not, you know, sifting coffee grounds through my teeth. And then uh, moving on, Josephine Cochran was a woman who was very well to do. She had a lot of servants, but while they were hand washing her fine china and dishes, they were breaking it. So she's like, I'll bet you I could invent my own dishwasher and not have these women washing my dishes and breaking them. And so she invented the very first dishwasher. It was very big and cumbersome and turned out to be more of a commercial dishwasher at first, but it was all the insights of like, why is a machine not washing my dishes instead of my servants who could be doing something else like making the bed and not breaking my china. Um, you know, I want I want to just pick up on that because I'm thinking to myself, if she was really wealthy, she probably had dinner parties. <laughs> so she yeah. needed a commercial. <laughs> yeah, she did. She did. She probably was able to use the one, but it's crazy to see like she got a metal drum and put racks in it. It's and then yeah. ran the water and put a spinning cycle on it. I mean, it's like she was just there to in invent, you know. Uh, other people, I, well, Hedy Lamar, she was an actress. She really invented how Wi-Fi is used today by looking at submarines pinging other ships and that kind of point-to-point -point relay system that we use Wi-Fi technology on now was really Hedy Lamar, actress, uh, beauty movie star. Um, another one I love is this Stephanie Kolek, who was a chemist. And she developed this very hard fiber, which is now known as Kevlar. Oh and goodness. there's over 200 applications. But if you look at bulletproof vests and the way it saves our soldiers and, and all, it was all invented by a woman. And there's just so many stories. I could do a whole series on just, in on just inventions. Women no. that are inventors, yeah. In, in your sojourns, did, did you discover what what instigated that idea of the Kevlar to her? You know, you know, I, I did, I think some, some discoveries like that are actually mistakes. Like they're trying mm -hmm. to find something like post, like post or whatever. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So I think, I think this might have been a mistake. I'm not really sure. I didn't think, I don't think she went out trying to find this material that would be so durable, but she just happened upon it. But again, she was immersed in stuff that she loved to do and, you know, just, you know, got, got into that. I mean, the other woman that invented the first, uh, word processor, she was a typist and she, she wanted to be able to kind of see things as they were typed. And, um, so she created the first word processing system. So oh, gosh. I, I was going to say there, there's something in people's genes though. There, there's so many women who have actually created hundreds of inventions. They're just, I mean, Hedy Lamar wasn't just this Wi-Fi technology. She came up with like literally hundreds of, of new inventions. And she was, she had a little lab in her home and would just be constantly thinking of new ways to do things. Wow. Well, 
we're we're almost out of time, but not quite, not quite. Okay. I, I want because there's one question I really want us to to talk about. We're we're fortunately in the 21st century, not in the 19th, so there are more more possibilities. But but I think what we have been talking about is that we really still need to do more to help young women. Uh, understand their real potential. So what can mothers and aunts and grandmothers and yeah, even fathers and brothers and uncles and grandfathers, what can we do to really help create that environment? Well, the first thing I'd say is that any children, at girls or boys, are never too young to be introduced to all of these stories. And there's, I would point people towards children's books about these great scientists. Mm. I mean, there are many examples from children's books of, of the stories behind these women and what they did. Um, I would also say just that focus on self-confidence. I mean, and, and really kind of letting people explore whatever passion they might have without any pre prejudices that you have about being in a certain box or a role, um, just let people really let those kids explore and and give them more role models and and that stuff to do and and build their self confidence. And with that, I think their passions will follow. And not all of us need to be in the STEM field, but it sure would be better if we were more evened out. And when I think about like women inventors, how different the world would look if women had been encouraged to invent, yeah. we, we would be light years ahead of where we are today if they just hadn't been slowed down in the process. So um, spread the stories, get to know these people, do your own research because it's like going into a little rabbit hole once you start looking. <laughs> One of the things I do in my class is whatever course I'm going to teach, like women in medicine or women in biology, I ask all my students to go find their favorite example. And they come back and they go, I can't believe how many I found. So we do have this resource, the great World Wide Web and Internet, and you can find these stories out there. They're all there. Or it sounds like we can just go to your website, go to the Unlocked website, and get our fill there. That, that's true. In fact, if you come to my website, you and you there's there's a reference to every single show. And if you look down the images of the people, more than half are women. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> so you're doing your part right now, Madeline. <laughs> and and all I do is look for people who have good things to say. I mean valuable things to say. So yes. you know. Well, I was actually amazed. I when I taught this class the first time, half of the students were men. I was I was surprised mm -hmm. that they and they were the biggest champions and advocates. They they were most yes. appalled by the stories. The women kind of knew of the stories, like yeah. yeah, we know we've been treated like this. But the men were like, "Aren't you outraged?" <laughs> yes. You know, when I was when I was doing the serious work on gender in organizations, I would always look for senior executives who had daughters who were about. 16, 17. Oh, they became real advocates. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. Understood. Not my yeah. daughter. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Right. Exactly. Well, Julia, this has just been such a pleasure talking about this subject oh, with you. Good. I love uh, it. I'm I, passionate about it. <laughs> oh, I can tell. I can tell. <laughs> Are there any final things that you'd like to say to the audience before we close off our conversation? Well, uh, just like before I knew about these stories, I just went blissly along, kind of probably knowing that women were have not been treated fairly. I was really so amazed by the laws and regulations and, you know, people just blocking people out. And I was inspired by women who, even though they weren't in science themselves, a woman who made a huge donation to Johns Hopkins Medical School said, I'm only making this donation if you agree to let so many women into the medical school. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to be a STEM person yourself to help make the difference and help champion these women and share their stories. So I just say, go forth and, and spread the word. Great. Julia Lochran, thank you so much. Thank you, Madeline. It was really fun to be with you today. Good. Every now and then, there is something that changes how I think about the world. 
Grounds for Thought is a place where I talk about these moments so that you can explore the meaning for yourself. I spent a number of years of my career studying the issues that women encounter in the workplace, such as social issues, personal issues, psychological issues, a lack of knowledge, a lack of opportunity. My focus was always on the behaviors of leaders and the impact those behaviors had on the careers of women, but also on the work itself. Today's conversation has been what women themselves bring to the table, a topic I appreciate because it is something I can influence in myself. What do I bring to the table? And I can do that through research, through training, through sharing of knowledge, all kinds of things. Well, grounds for thought. That's why I want to talk about the book called Wild Women, Crusaders, Curmudgeons, and Completely Corsetless Ladies in the otherwise virtuous Victorian era. That's a long title, The Wild Women, by Autumn Stevens. Now, when I think of all that I have done for other women and for myself, I was taken aback by the stories of the women of this book. Keeping in mind that this was a very different time of social behaviors, Victorian era, women were expected to faint when things got difficult, By the way, there was absolutely no consideration to the fact that their corsets merely restricted their breathing. Women were also expected to remain silent in certain conversation because their minds were not considered strong enough for topics like politics. This meant that women should also not speak in public. Then I encountered wild women who challenged all the assumptions and norms of that age. I'm going to tell you about two of them. The first is Sojourner Truth from 1797 to 1883. Most people know that she was a former slave who had been the, had the audacity to speak in public. It was so outlandish that one audience asked a committee of matrons to examine her bosoms to make certain she was a woman. Now, at the conclusion of Sojourner's remarks, she ripped open her bodice, bearing her well-used breasts to all. Those breasts that had been used by her own children and many white children. And she said, see for yourselves. Do you wish also to suck? Wow, what a woman. I thought about this and realized that in all my public remarks, which have been plenty, I never dreamed of bearing my breasts. If I had lived in her time, would I have had the courage? I don't know. And then there was Mary Jones, otherwise known as Mother Jones, 1830 to 1930. She was considered the most dangerous woman in America, according to one prosecuting attorney. What had she done? She looked at many industries, the cotton mills, the beer breweries, the coal and copper mines, wherever working men squirmed beneath the heel of the capitalist oppressor. She stirred up strikes. And when the men would not do so, she took the wives to the confrontations. And what did they do? They brought what they had, brooms and mops and tin pans. Now, their demonstrations became rather noisy, if nothing else. And in fact, they did do some other things as well. Again, I found myself thinking, would I ever have the guts? It turned out I have done mm, some pretty courageous things. For example, I've told the emperor he or she has no clothes on more than once. But Mother Joan's actions made me think and examined what am I doing to see how I can make everything I do even stronger. Wild Women by Autumn Stevens. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you've enjoyed the conversation and learned something new. And if you would like to explore what it means to develop your resilient leader with me as your coach, schedule a conversation by sending me an email to madeline at madelineblair.com. And if you did learn something today, 
write it in a post-it note or a, a social media, what you learned and might do differently. And if you're on YouTube, click the like button. Better yet, subscribe. I'm Madeline Blair, wishing you infinite possibilities as you unlock your resilience.